Essays on the Science of Mythology, Part 1, The Primordial Child in Primordial Times, by C. Karenyi. 1. Child Gods. Mythology is never the biography of the gods, as often appears to the observer. This is particularly true of mythology properly so called. Mythology in its purest, most pristine form. It is more it is both more and less. It is always less than a biography, even though it tells of the birth and the childhood of the gods, the deeds of their youth, and sometimes of their early death. The remarkable thing about these childish or youthful feats is that they show the god in the full perfection of their power and outward form, and thus really preclude biographical thinking, thinking in periods of life as stages of development. At the same time, mythology is more than any biography, for although it may tell us nothing that relates organically to a particular period of life, it nevertheless comprehends the periods themselves as timeless realities. The figure of the child plays a part in the mythology equal to that of the marriageable girl, or kore, and the mother. In mythology, these two, like every other possible form of being, are manifestations of the divine. The deeds of the child Apollo remain Apollonian, and the pranks of the child Hermes are not so much childish as Hermaic. The classical Greek was determined to view these two gods under an eternally youthful aspect since, conceived as figures in all their purity and perfection, Apollo and Hermes are molded most clearly out of all possible earthly forms in the timeless form of the youth. It is the same as the figure of Zeus, as the regal-looking man in middle life, and or Saturn in late antiquity as the grumpy old greybeard. Archaic Greece saw its Apollo its Hermes and Dionysus as bearded figures, and this shows that divinity and humanity can touch at yet another point, at the summit of the only maturity we mortals can reach. But to grasp the eternal, which is the essence of every one of these gods, is the perishable, in the perishable bloom of youth, youth, that is by far the harder task. Until Greek art solved it, the bearded figures of men, figures that were almost ageless, were the most typical forms of expression. In the figures of godlike men, youths, and, ancient, and ancients, Greek mythology never expresses any biographical element or phase of life, but always the nature or essence of the god. The bearded archaic type, Hermes, Apollo, Dionysus, depicted at the height of their powers, the acme of Greek manly perfection, as also Zeus and Poseidon, is the simplest visible expression of that timeless quality which Homer ascribes to the gods when he says, They age not, they die not, they are eternal. Whether portrayed archaically in ageless maturity or classically in idealized form, the actual age of these divine youths or men has above all a symbolic value. In them, richness of life and richness of meaning are one. Their very nature removes them from any, every conceivable biographical relationship. Many gods, almost all those we have mentioned, appear not only as men and youths, but also in the childness of child go- in the likeness of child gods. And it might seem as if the child possessed that biographical significance which we have just denied. It may be asked whether Greek mythology introduces the child Hermes or the child Apollo merely because it happens to know his father and mother and because the story of his birth naturally leads on to the story of his childhood. But this kind of biographical approach gets us no further than the inclusion of the age of childhood in the history of the gods. No sooner is the figure of the child there than it, was, than it is cancelled and replaced by the figure of the god. Little Hermes at once becomes Hermes, little Hercules is at once in full possession of his strength and valor, but the richness of life and the meaning in the wonder-working child is no whit smaller than in the bearded god. On the contrary, it seems to be even richer and more profoundly moving. With the appearance of the child god, whether in the Homeric hymn to Hermes in the myth of Zeus or Dionysus, or in Virgil's for Echologue, we feel ourselves surrounded by the mythological atlas here which modern people call fairy-like, fairy-tale-like. If anyone supposes that 
in the child god, they have discovered the biographical element of mythology, they are heading, heading for surprises. For there, for here, as the seemingly biographical point, they will find themselves completely outside all biography and in the primordial realm of mythology where their most marvelous creations grow and flourish. For which interpretation, then, have we to decide? For the assumption that the figure of the child god is the result of biographical thinking, or for the idea that the biographical point of view is probably only of secondary importance, and that the primary thing which directly concerns us is the play of mythology itself? A play like the playing of an invisible great composer who varies the same theme, the primordial figure of the child, in the keys of the various gods, is not the primordial child, the child god of so many mythologems, the one and only true Phileas ante patrum, whose life, seen in retrospect, first produces the checkered history of one's origins? We must either put this idea in a clearer and more certain light, or else refute it, and if we wish to understand the mythological account of the child gods. By the way to such an understanding, is to let the mythologists speak for themselves, and so now we present a series of them. 2. The Orphan Child Ancient mythologists of child gods are surrounded by and evoke an aura of fairy tale, not for any unaccountable, essentially irrational reason, but rather because of their clearly visible and ever-recurring characteristics. The child god is usually an abandoned foundling. Often it is threatened by extraordinary dangers. It may be devoured like Zeus, or torn to pieces like Dionysus. On the other hand, these dangers are not altogether surprising. They are features as natural to the vision of the titanic world as discord and trickery are to the primitive mythologians. Sometimes the father is the child's enemy, as was Cronus, or he may be merely absent, as Zeus was when Dionysus was being torn to pieces by the titans. We have a rare case in the Homeric hymn to Pan. Little Pan was abandoned by his mother and nurse, terrified they had let the newborn infant lie there. His father, Hermes, picked him up, wrapped him in a hare skin, and bore him away to Olympus. Here again we have two contrasting fates. In the one, the child god is an abandoned abortion. In the other, he sits at Zeus's side among the gods. The mother has a peculiar part to play. She is and is not at the same time. To take an ancient Ital Italic ex example, the child Tagis, from whom the Etruscans received their sacred science, sprang out of the earth before the eyes of the plowman, a child of Mother Earth, and at the same time the purest type of fatherless and motherless foundling. Simile was already dead when Dionysus was born. The mother of Asclepius did not survive her son's birth. We could also mention the figures in heroic sagas, who were likewise abandoned by their mothers as children violently separated from them or exposed to death. But we would rather confine ourselves to mythology properly so called, and shall only tell of gods who occupy a central place in genuine mythologies and cults. Even to the greatest among them, Zeus, something very similar happened. When he was born, his mother, in order to save him at all, exposed him. The nursing of the child by divinities or wild beasts in the myths of Zeus, and the imitation of it in the cult of the young Dionysus, shows us two things. The solitariness of the child god, and the fact that he is nevertheless at home in the prim primeval world an equivocal situ situation at once that of the orphan child and a cherished son of the gods. Another variation on the theme is when the mother shares the child's abandonment and solitude. She wanders about homeless and is persecuted, like Leto, whom her newborn son, the little Apollo, defends against the brutal Titios. Or else she lives without honor, far from Olympus, like Maya, the mother of Hermes, her position, originally that of Mother Earth, one of those names she bears, is no longer entirely simple in the Homeric hymn. The simple situation shows us the abandonment of the newborn god in both variations. In the one, the mother and child are abandoned as Leto was with Apollo on the barren island of Delos. In the other, the child is alone in a rough and primitive world. Here, the fairy tale atmosphere becomes concrete. We are reminded of the orphan child in European and Asiatic folklore and how he was abandoned. 
no matter where it was or was not, though even that there was a town, and in the southern quarter of the town a tumble-down house inhabited by an orphan child, left all on its own after the death of its father and mother. So begins a Hungarian legend. There are parallels both to the variation in which the child is wholly abandoned and to that which is left with a mother or nurse. A fairy tale of the Black Forest Tartars in the Altai Mountains begins as follows. Once upon a time, long ago, there lived a little orphan boy, created of God, created of Panjana, without food to eat, without clothes to wear, so he lived. No woman to marry him. A fox came. The fox said to the youth, How will you get to be a man? He said, and the boy said, I don't know myself how I shall get to be a man. One of the epic songs of another Altaic tribe, the Shore, comes closer to the mother and child variation. The woman called At Altian Sabak lives in the wilderness, without cattle, with nobody round her. She looks after her little boy. She casts her hook into the white sea. Every day she catches a young pike. In well water she cooks it. They eat the broth. So Alchen Sabak looks after this little orphan boy. Here the woman is the hero's elder sister, a peculiarity of these songs. The appearance of this situation in folklore and saga, though it is a far cry from those examples of the world of antiquity, raises the question, was not the orphan child the ancestor of the child god, and was not this child taken over into the mythological from descriptions of a certain kind of human fate, such as is possible in the most diverse cultures, and there elevated to divine rank? Or was it the other way around? Is the child god earlier and the orphan child of folklore only a pale reflection of him? Which is primary, folk tale or myth, which came first, solitude in a primeval world, or the purely human picture of the orphan's fate? This question forces itself on all, on us all, the more urgently when we reflect that there are cases where the mythology of the child god and the folklore of the orphan child are absolutely inseparable. A case of the kind now follows, though we stray even further from the nonce, for the nonce from the word of world of antiquity. Three, a Vogel god. The mythology that allows us to see a little deeper into the original state of affairs is to be found among the Vogels. Their store of myths, collected by the Hungarian anthropologist A. Reguli and B. Munkowski is preserved for us in uncorrupt original texts, with the last, which the last named has published with a literal Hungarian translation. In the following, we attempt to reproduce this transition, translation faithfully. The Vogels worshipped, and perhaps still worship, one especially among their gods who bears, who bears the name of the man who looks like the world. The man who looks at the world. He is a god let down from heaven in two variations, with his mother and without her. With his mother, he was let down in such a way that he was born as the son of a woman expelled from heaven. She fell upon the banks of the river Ob. Under her right armpit, two ribs broke out. A child with golden hands and feet was born. This manner of birth, the emergence of the child from its mother right, mother's right side, betrays a Buddhist influence. The Bodhivitsa, who later became Guatam Buddha, entered his mother's womb from the right side at the end of ten months, left, and at the end of ten months, left the right side of his mother again in full consciousness and immaculate. This is in accordance to the Buddha legend of the northern sect, Mahatyam Buddhism, as it is called. The man who looks at the world is an exact translation of Avalokit. Kiteshvara, the name of the world rooting Bodhavista in the above religion, whose missionaries are dispersed through northern Asia. Avalokiteshvara is just such a divinity compassionately observing the world as the god of the, the as the god of the Vogels became. From the latter's title, which refer to him as goose, swan, or crane, we get a glimpse of his original nature. 
Golden limbs are as characteristic of him as the newborn Buddha of the Avalokit Shivara world, our world, who gleamed shining like gold, worked in the fire by the master's hand. The orphan's fate has nothing to do with all this and leads us into a world quite different from that of the Dalai Lama, the present-day embodiment of Alakit Shavara. The child god of the Vogels, however, before he became the man who looks at the world, while still a small boy, came down to earth without his mother. A council is held in heaven. Sometimes the world of the age of man will come to be his father's little son, his father's darling, his mother's little son, his mother's darling. How will man standing on his feet, how will man endure him? Let us give him the hands of another. In another's hands he shall be taught tameness. To the uncle and aunt of his father, to the uncle and aunt of his mother, he shall be given. We hear of a cradle hanging between heaven and earth in which he is drawn up or let down according to the resolve of his father, the upper heaven. His father set him in a curved cradle with a silver edge. He let him down to the world of men, inhabitants of the lower earth, on to the roof of his man-uncle. He of the eagle's feathers, he fell with a mighty voice of thunder. Instantly his uncle was outside, took him in. By day he teaches him, by night he teaches him. So he grows, his aunt beats him. So he grows, his uncle beats him. So his bones grow hard and hard his muscles. Yet a second time his aunt beats him. Yet a third time his uncle. We hear of his sorry plight in the house of a Russian. How he was kept behind the door. How dishwater is emptied over him. Sorrier yet is his plight in the house of Samoyed, who binds him to his sleigh with an iron cable thirty rods long. How hard he has to work for the Samoyed in less, is less apparent from our texts than from kindred accounts and fairy tales of manhandled heroes and sons of gods. All the more moving, then, is the description of the child's suffering. When, beaten almost to death with a club of mammoth bone, he is cast on the dunghill and intended as a sacrificial victim. Here the nadir is reached. Now the turn sets in. The boy suddenly becomes possessed of snowshoes, armor, quiver, bow, and sword. He shoots an arrow through the seven stags, stag, stag, stags. He shoots another through seven elks. He sacrifices Samoyed's son, pulverizes seven Samoyed cities, destroys the Russian and the Russian city with the pressure of his back, the pressure of his breast. Slay is his uncle and his aunt. It is an epiphany, no less terrible than that of Dionysus on the ship of the Etruscan pirates in the Homeric hymn. From the miserable plight of the orphan there emerges a god. The turning of the tide of fortune is not only impressive, it is also significant. With the Vogel mythology, we approach very closely to a similar, to a familiar type of fairy tale, that of Strong Hans. But a comparison with this particular tale shows much less impressive and significant, how much, much less impressive and significant the fairy tale is. What meaning it has come solely from the grotesquely exaggerated feats of an exceptionally strong farmer's boy and the absurd situations that result. The difference is like not in the environment or in the social atmosphere, though the atmosphere of the Volga myths is anything but regal, but in what we may call the dramatic structure of the mythology. Such a structure is entirely lacking in this type of fairy tale. The uncommon bodily strength of the youngster is explained in advance by reference to his birth and mode of nourishment. He was suckled for several years, or ate enough for nine people. His father was a bear, or, in one Hungarian tale, his mother a mare, a cow, a fairy. He was hatched out of an egg or forged of iron. All this, of course, points to the mythological origin of the tale, but reduces the action to a lower plane, from the world of high drama to the world of astonishing exceptions to which we are so accustomed in fairy tales. What is it, on the other hand, that affects us so powerful in the mythology? the very thing that constitutes its whole meaning, and that is the revelation of divinity in the paradoxical union of the lowest and highest, the weakest and strongest. The question as to which is primary, orphan child or child god, is thus considered simpli considerably simplified. The emergence of a god's son or a king's son from the orphan child as a theme for myth or fairy tale presupposes the orphan situation. 
It is this situation that makes the emergence possible in the first place, but the plight of the orphan does not, insofar as it is purely human, human furnish any sufficient reason for such an emergence. Considered apart from mythology and from the standpoint of ordinary human life, that plight is not necessarily consummated in an epiphany. But if the epiphany is, as it were, the fruit and fulfillment of the orphan's fate, then the whole situation must be understood in mythological terms, and we have to inquire, does mythology know of an orphan's fate that is compatible with divine form, or rather with the figure of a god in whom this fate is an essential characteristic? 4. Culervo. We shall now be confronted with a picture of the orphan child of the folk tales, a picture painted in full detail, so that we may decide on the ground of immediate evidence whether it points in the direction of mythology or merely to a realistic description of a certain type of human fate. Not individual themes, but the whole picture shall speak for itself. The theme of the miraculous birth has already led us in the direction of mythology. The picture stands in the Kalevala, in heroic frame, a description of the servitude of Kulervo, Kulervo's son. Kulervo, Kalervo's son. He has been recognized afresh in the strong Hans of the Finnish fairy tale, Munu Pojaka, the boy born of an egg. Again, he has been compared with the hamlet of, Dan of Danish saga. Like him, Kulervo, in the Kalevala, remained alive to avenge his father. But even in this element, it is not the exclusive property of the saga. The orphan child god of the Vogels in their Song of God Heroes was also the deathless avenger. A hero of Finnish antiquity, Yuntambo by name, as we read, read in book 31 of the Kalevala, exterminated the clan of his brother, Kaler Kalervo. Of all the tribe of Kalervo, there was only left his young wife, and she was pregnant. Untamo, Untamo's army led her away with them to their homeland to do the chores, the cleaning, and sweeping. Before long, a little boy was born to this unhappy mother, and she cast about for a name. She called him Kulervo, the battle hero. The little boy was swaddled and lay fatherless in a crib, and his mother sat rocking it. She rocked him till his hair tossed, rocked him all day and the next and the third day, and the boy kicked out with his feet before and behind him and tore off the swaddling clothes, crawled out, and broke the limewood cradle to pieces. Already in the third month, thoughts of vengeance awoke in the knee-high boy, and he wanted to avenge his father and mother. This came to Untamo's ears. They deliberated how best they might destroy the miraculous child, and they tried first with all of the water. They put him in a barrel, a little cast, and pushed it out upon the waves. After two nights they went to see whether the boy had sunk in the water and perished in his barrel. But he had not sunk in the water or perished in his barrel. He had crawled out of the barrel and was now sitting on the waves with a rod copper in his hand. At the end of it, there was a silken thread, and he was angling in the lake for a fish as he floated through the water. There was enough water in the lake to fill two ladles, and possibly, if exactly measured, a part of a third. Untamo then sought to destroy the child with fire, and so they gathered and collected a large supply of dry birch wood, a hundred needled pine oozing with resin, a thousand slayfuls of bark, and a hundred rods of dry ash. Having set fire to the woodpile, they cast the boy into the middle of the blades. The pyre burnt all that day and the next, and was still burning on the third day. Then they went to look. The boy was sitting up to his knees in ashes and up to his arms embers with a rake in his hand. He was not stirring up the fire, raking the coals together. Not a hair was singed, not a lock displaced. Finally, a third attempt was made to destroy the child with what we may call in this connection the airy element. Untamo had the boy strung up on an oak tree. When after the usual time a lad was sent to look at him, he brought back the message. Kulevro is not yet perished, has not died upon the tree. He is carving pictures on it, holding a gravure in his hand. The whole tree is covered with pictures. The oak is a mass of carvings. There are men with swords and spears at their sides. Where should you, Utamo now seek aid against this most miserable boy? Whatever the death he prepared for him, whatever the destruction he planned, the wicked lad could never be brought to ruin. 
That's what we may call the first variation on the theme in the musical sense of the word. Actually, it consists of three variations. The, a more extensive analysis would only tend to break down certain units that are effective as wholes, for example, the child and the elements in which it subsists. Each of these variations has an instant effect on us, chiefly because of the poetic composition and painter-like design. Later, we shall see how this composition, the composition of the child in water, is not only outwardly effective, but full of meaning too. For the present, we shall only recall how child and, fi and fire go together in mythology. Heaven was in labor, earth was in labor, and the purple sea was in labor. The blood-red seaweed had birth pangs. The hollow stem of the seaweed emitted smoke. The hollow stem of the seaweed emitted flame. And out of the flame sprang a little boy. Fire for hair, fire for beard, and his eyes were suns. Such was the birth of a divine child, as reported in one of the ritual songs of the old heathen Armenians. In mythology, to which reference has been made in my explanation of Virgil's fourth eclogue. It is tempting to classify this mythologism under the tube birth myths, as Frobrinius has called one of the groups of solar mythology, but the faint echo of it in the variant Kulervo in the fire is enough to make us realize what sort of elemental material it is out of which there are molded and images the images of the orphan's fate. For example, these three ways of compassing Colervo's doom. This material is undoubtedly the primal stuff of mythology, and not that of biography, a stuff from which the life of the gods and not the life of men is formed. What, from the purely human point of view, is an unusually tragic situation, the orphan's exposure and persecution, appears in mythology in quite another light. It simply shows up the loneliness and solitude of elemental beings, a loneliness peculiar to the primordial element, if anything, the fate of the orphan Kulervo, delivered up to every force of destruction and exposure to all the elements, must be the true orphan's fate in the fullest sense of the word, exposure and persecution. But at the same time, this fate is the triumph of the elemental nature of the wonder child. The human fate of the orphan does not truly express the fate of such miraculous beings, and is only secondary, yet it is just their symbolic orphanhood that gives them their significance. It expresses the primal solitude which alone is appropriate to such beings in such a situation, namely in mythology. The first three-part variation on the Kulervo theme occurs on this original mythological level, but it is very instructive to find that everything in the Kaleva, Kalevala that reminds us of the feats of the strong Huns in the fairy tale can be fitted into this myth-like episode as a further variation of it. Kulervo Kul solves all the tasks set him in such a way that the solution exceeds all expectations and rebounds to the injury of the task masker. Elias Lohner acted in full accord with the stylistic, stylistic feelings of the Kalevala singers when he compiled these songs. Finnish folklore refers to the variations of the Kulervo cycle to one and the same person, although it is familiar with the picture of the child floating on the water in other connections as well. The fairy tale element stands beside the mythological element like another variation on the same musical theme. The savage consummation of the first task does not so much conjure up the fairy tale atmosphere as echo the savagery of primitive mythology. Kulevo, the knee-high boy, having now grown about a span in height, is charged with care, the care of a small boy. So he watched all day, and the next broke the baby's hands, gouged out his eyes, and on the third day let him die altogether of sickness, threw the napkins in the river, and burned the baby's cradle. Untamo, in the true manner of primitive mythology, is not in the least indignant, but merely reflects, such a one is quite unfitted to attend to little children, or to touch them with his fingers, now I know not where to send him, nor, nor what work I ought to give him. Maybe he should clear, could clear the forest. So he told him, clear the forest. There follows a story of how Kulervo got, gets an axe made and how he set himself to work. A clearing of enormous proportions is effected by means of this axe and then, better in keeping with the spirit of the Finnish epic, by means of magic song. The next tax is crowned with similar immoderate success, that of building a fence. The final task set for Untamo, threshing, is particularly reminiscent of the Strong Hans fairy tale of other European nations. 
Kulervo, the son of Kuler, Kul, of Kalervo, now began threshing the corn. He threshed the corn to a fine dust and pounded the ears to chaff. The climax of his lethal excursions is reached when Kulevra is employed as a cowherd by the wife of a blacksmith. Il Man Arian, in Book 33 of the Kalava, the jocular lady, toothless old hag that she has, baked a loaf for him, gave him two great slabs of bread with oats below, corn on top, and a stone in the middle. With this provision sent Kulevra out with her cows. In revenge, she slaughtered the whole word, summoned a pack of wolves and bears, magically caused the white little beast to appear in the form of the cattle, and constructed various musical instruments from the bones of the slaughtered. Then he made a pipe out of the cowboy and a whistle out of the ox horn, and a cow horn out of the tom, out of Tuomiki's leg, and a flute out of Kiroyo's shinbone, and he played on his pipe and tooted on his horn, and three times and in his native hills, and six times at the opening of the pathway. But Ilman, Il, Ilmarinen's wife, the old woman of the blacksmith, had long been waiting for the milk and was looking forward to the summer butter. When she heard the trampling in the marshes and the uproar in the hearth, she explained, Praise be to Yumala, the horn sounds and the herd is coming. But where on earth has the wretch got a cow's horn and made himself to blow on? And why does he come with such a noise, blowing with lungs fit to burst, splitting my eardrums and making my poor old head ache? Then Kolervo, son of Kalervo, answered and said, The wretch found the horn in the mount marshes and picked the pipe out of the bog. Your herd is in the run. The cows are in the hurdle field. Go and smoke the cattle and milk the cows. So, Ilmarian's wife told the old crone to do the milking. Go, old one, and milk the cattle and look after the beasts, for I can't leave my kneading. Then Kulervo, son of Kalervo, answered and said, A good housewife, a clever housewife, always milks the cows herself. So Ilmarinen's wife went herself to smoke the cattle and look after the beasts, and herself milked the cows. She surveyed the herd and gazed on the horned cattle, saying, What a fine sight is this herd. The cattle are all sleek and glossy as though rubbed with lynx skin, with a wild sheep's wool. Their udders are full of bursting, the teeth are all hard. She stooped down to milk them, bent down to coax the milk out, pulled once, pulled twice, pulled yet a third time, when a wolf sprang at her fiercely, and a bear rushed to the attack, and the wolf tore at her mouth, and the bear tore at her leg, bit through the flesh of her calf, and crushed the shin bone. Thus Kulervo, son of Kalervo, repaid the old woman's jest, and had his revenge for the wicked old woman's mockery. It is impossible to try to derive Finnish mythology from Greek mythology or vice versa, but it is equally impossible not to notice that Kulervo, the wonder child and mightier youngster in one, ultimately reveals himself as Hermes and Dionysus. He reveals himself as Hermes because of the making of musical instruments in connection with the destruction of cattle. Compare in particular that version of the mythologem of the Hermes child where the stealing and slaying of cattle precede the invention of the lyre. Liar. He reveals himself as Dionysus because of what he does with the mild beasts and with his enemy. It is purely Dionysian. We can call it no less if we regard it in the terms of the Greek mythology. When the wolves and the bears are magicked by him into docile cows and Dionysian, that it is they who punish his enemy. With something of a shudder, we recognize the tragic and ironic atmosphere of Euripides' Bacchaeans as we read the dramatic scene of the milking of the wild beasts. The fate of the Etruscan pirates, Dionysus' enemies, who were punished at the onset of the beasts of prey, form a still closer analogy to the vengeful epiphany of the child gods of the Vogels. 5. Narayana The child god, prototype of the wonderful orphan child, feeling quite at home in the primal element, reveals his full significance with the scene of his epiphany in, wa is, in wa is water. When the scene of his epiphany is water. When we recall the epiphany of Kurvor sitting on the waves with the rod of copper in his hands, when we further recall his skill in clearing forests, we see at once his affinity with the little copper man in Book Two of the Ka Livala. But apart from that, Kulervo was quite obviously neither knee-high nor a span in height, but a giant for whom there was only enough water in the lake to fill two ladles, and possibly, if exactly measured, part of a third.
In book two, much of the same thing happens, and moreover there is a striking parallel to this giantism, which seems incompatible with the hero's childlike hood, childhood in another great mythology. The Hindu Markandeya, the eternally youthful hermit, encountered such a wonder child at the termination of the last and the beginning of the present cosmic year. The story is to be found in the Markandeya Samar Samarsya Pravan of the Mahabharata. The wise hermit was wandering about over the fence of the world ocean and came to the Niagrodha tree, Ficus Indicia, in whose branches a little boy lay. The, the boy bade the hermit to rest with him. Markandeya tells what then happened. The god offers me a resting place within him. I become weary of my long life and mortal existence. He opens his mouth, and I am drawn into it with irresistible force. There, in his belly, I see the whole world, with its lands and cities, with the Ganges and the other rivers and the sea and the four castles, even at its work the lions, tigers, and wild pigs, Indra and all the heavenly host, the Rudras, the Adit, the Adityas and the fathers, the snakes, the elephants, in short, everything that I have seen in the world, I see in his belly as I wander about in it. For more than a hundred years I wander about in it without coming to the end of his body, and then I call upon the god and I am instantly expelled from his mouth with the force of the wind. Once more I see him sitting in the branches of the Niagrodha tree with the signs of divinity upon him, clothed in yellow garments. This child god who is the god of the universe, is Narayana, and according to the Indian etymology, he who has water as his dwelling place. However, much in the story is in the style of the Indian world, e.g. the detailed description and the philosophical complexion of the whole. It cannot, be, it cannot obscure the outlines of the mythologem. The picture of a divine being adrift in the solitude of the ocean world at once child and giant is clear enough. It is in the less philosophical world of Finnish woodsmen the pictorial style is different, though the outline is the same. We have already met it with Cuvero variation, but still have to make its acquaintance in the variation of the little copper man. Vainamoinen, the pronto shaman, rose from the ocean at the beginning of the world and met a wonder child. We might almost say that the Finnish counterpart to the Etruscan Tajis. The name of the child, Sam Sa Samson, probably alludes to his gigantic strength. Peller Voinen, son of the earth, Samsa and the slender limbed boy, came to sow the land and scatter the seed. He sows the land with trees, among them an oak which later rises to heaven and covers the sun and moon with its branches. The giant tree had to be felled. Vayan Moinen turned to the power of water. Here we see the Finnish counterpart to the Indian Narayana. A man rose out of the sea, a hero from the waves. He was not the hugest of the huge, nor yet the smallest of the small. He was as big as a man's thumb, the span of a woman. His helmet was of copper, copper the boots of his feet, copper the gauntlets on his arm, copper their laces, copper the belt on his body, copper the axe in the belt, and haft was a thumb's length, and a blade a nail's length. Van Moynian, old and wily, pondered as follows. He looked like a man, and has the mane of a hero, but he's no bigger than a thumb, and no higher than an ox foot. Hoof. Then he said, You seem more like a man to me, and most contemptible of heroes. You're no better than a dead man, and a face on you like a corpse. Whereas the little man from the sea, the hero of the waves, made answer. I am a man, as you will see, small but a mighty water hero. I have come to fell the oak tree and splinter it to fragments. Vine Moinen, old and wily, scoffed, why? You haven't the strength. You'll never be able to fell the magic oak tree and splinter it to fragments. Scarcely had he said the words when, before his eyes, the little man was transformed into a giant. He stamped with his feet on the earth, and his head reached up to the clouds, and his beard flowed to his knees, and his hair uh, to his heels. His eyes were fathoms wide, and his legs fathoms long, and his knees were only one and a half fathoms in girth, and his hips two fathoms. 
He whetted the axe blade and swiftly brought it to a fine edge, using six hard grindstones and seven polishing stones. Then he strode off, his wild trousers flooding around the, his legs in the wind. With one stride reached the sandy shore, seashore. The next stride took him far into the dark land, and the third to the roots of the oak tree. He struck the tree with his axe and smote it with polished blade. Once, twice, and a third time, sparks flew from the axe and a flame from the oak as he tried to bend the magic tree to his will. At the third stroke, the oak tree was shattered. The hundred boughs had fallen. The, tr the trunk stretched to the east, the top to the west. The leaves were scattered to the south and the branches to the north. Now that the oak tree was felled and the proud trunk leveled, the sun shone again and the dear moon glimmered pleasantly. The clouds sailed far and wide and a rainbow spanned the heavens. Book two of the Kale Vala, from which these lines were, are taken, was undoubtedly written later than the passage just quoted from the Mahad, ha, Mahabharata. But judging by its sense as a story with, about the liberation of light, it may be ranged among, alongside the earliest of primitive mythologies. It is true that similar features relating to the miraculous childhood are to be found among the near neighbors of the Finns, that is to say, in the Russian epic folk tales, Bailin, which a Russian scholar of the last century attempted to derive from Indian sources, but namely the story of Krishna's childhood. But the correspondence between the childhood adventures of Russian heroes and those of Hindu gods is at best nothing but the borrowing of a sumptuous foreign garment, a borrowing mediated through many hands. It is not only Russian or Indian saints or heroes that literature and legend adorn with, for instance, a birth which causes the world to shake and all the elements to tremble. Markandiyas and Vainomoinen's encounters with a giant child, who, who is quite at home in the primal water, show a correspondence at a much deeper level. The question, therefore, is not which of the two mythologies is a variant of the other, but which is the common primary theme of which both are variants. To this we have an answer of fundamental importance in both Hindu and Finnish mythology, and it leaves us no doubt as to the nature of the divine figure whose essential characteristic is some kind of orphan's fate. Narayana is the child god, i.e. the divine principle of the universe at the moment of the first manifestation, who is called pra Prajapati in the most ancient Indian sacrificial books, the Brahmanas, and even in the big rig in the Rigveda, he has was hatched out of an egg which came into being in the waters of the beginning, hatched, that is to say, out of the void. He reclines on the back of a sea monster, floats in the cup of water flowers. He is the primordial child in the primordial solitude of the primordial element, the primordial child that is the unfolding of the primordial egg, just as the whole world is his unfolding. Thus far, Indian mythology. Finnish mythology also has the primal element, the waters of the beginning. It is likewise similar, familiar with the creation of the world from an egg. Mana Pojka, son of the egg, who also bears the name Kulervo, the child for whom the sea contains not quite three littlefuls of water, and who may be recognized in the light bringing little copper man, the Finnish brother of the egg born Praja Pati and the yellow garbed. Narayana. The ethnological investigation of myths, especially Frobenius's unfinished Zeind Talter des Sonnen Gottes, points in two directions once a common basic theme has been attained. The first direction goes deep into the undermost layers of culture. For the mythology under discussion is not contained, confined to Indian or Finnish territory, but evidently belongs to the very ancient period of mankind, an epoch compared with, with which not only Indian and Finnish sources, but the whole character of Greek civilization as well are considerably younger. We shall not, however, begin with this hypothesis, but conversely, with mythologems whose prominence is known, and we shall utilize this hypothesis only when the mythologems themselves point to it, and to nothing else. We shall content ourselves with the reflection that the basic theme may possibly be looming in the background, wherever its variants, however faint and hard to recognize, are heard.
In these cases, we shall be sounding the primary note offstage and making audible again the melody that was on the point of fading away. The other direction indicated over and above this is Frobenius's, in Frobenius's book points to solar mythology. Our basic theme, the image of the child hatched from an egg, a golden egg risen from the sea, includes all kinds of origination and birth, rising and coming into being, hence also sunrise. In this way, could be re reduced to a solar myth, the simple allegory of a natural phenomenon. But we should then be going beyond mythology and destroying the very world in which we are now trying to find our bearings. A situation will arise as in the well-known case of a play. Like mythology, plays too can only be understood from the inside. Once we become conscious while playing that it is only an expression of vitality and nothing more, then the game is up. People who stand outside the game and regard it only in this light may be right at some one point, but all their knowledge tells us nothing. They reduce play to non-play without understanding its essence. Similarly, our basic theme can be regarded as the human experience of sunrise or a form of this experience, as a manifestation of it in dreams, visions, poetry, all human material. But this says nothing about the theme itself, nothing about the mythologium qua mythologium, which, on the contrary, is banished and dissolved like a dream. Can we say that this is the whole aim of understanding the art of poetry, to take an, exa an example analogous to mythology, mere banishment and disillusion? If we say within the bounds of mythology it is immediately evident why this reduction to a natural phenomenon, to non-myth, as Frobius calls it, is unjust and unsatisfactory and therefore false, in mythology, the allegorical value of a mythological image, such as the primordial image of all the child gods, and the allegorical value of the natural phenomenon themselves, the rising sun and the arising of the newborn child, are reciprocal and equal. The rising sun and the newborn child are just as much an allegory of the primordial child as the primordial child is an allegory of the rising sun and of all the newborn children in the world. Allegory means the description of one thing under the image of another. In both modes, the mode of the rising sun and the newborn human being and the mode of the mythological child, the world itself tells of its origin, birth, and childhood. It speaks a symbolic language. One symbol is the sun, the other, another human child in Goethe's word, Aleas Vergand Lich is Nier ein Gleichnis. And yet another, the primordial child. The world tells us when the world tells us what is in the world and what it is true in the world. A symbol is not an allegory, not just another way of speaking. It is an image presented by the world itself. In the image of the primordial child, the world tells of its as of its own childhood, of everything that sunrise and the birth of the child mean for and say about the world. The childhood and orphan's fate of the child gods have not evolved from the stuff of human life, but from the stuff of cosmic life. What appears to be biographical in mythology is, as it were, an anecdote that the world relates from its own biography in dreams, visions, and far more vividly and graphically than in these, more vividly and graphically than in ever, as ever possible for the profane arts in mythology. To take mythological images as allegories of natural phenomenon would be tantamount to robbing mythology of that nucleus which alone gives it life and meaning. It would be to rob it of its timelessness, timelessly valid human and more than human, i.e. cosmic content, which mythologically is expressed in the images of gods, just as in music, mathematics, and philosophy it is expressed in musical, mathematical, or philosophical ideas. Hence the relations of mythology to science, hence its spiritual character, by virtue of which it, like science, transcends the individual phenomenon. And mythology speaks for itself, acts for itself, and is true of itself, just like any other lofty science theory or musical creation, or indeed any true work of art. 6. Apollo the primal water conceived as the womb, the breast of the mother, and the cradle is genuinely, is a genuinely mythological image, a pictorial unit packaged with meaning and brooking no further analysis. It crops up in Christianity as well with a special clarity in the so-called theological discretion at the court of the Sassanides. 
There it was said that the mother who was pregnant with the child god of Hera, Pege, Myria, that she carried in her womb, as in a sea, a ship frightened a thousandfold. She has but one fish, it is added. The same, the same that is also called her ship. The Christian allegory of the fish is a secondary phenomenon in the history of the mythological fish symbol. Light will be thrown on this by mythologians still to be discussed. On the other hand, the primal water, as the womb is, in combination with fish-like or fish-like creatures, a scientific idea, not merely a mythology, but a philosophem as well. As such, it appears in both India and Greece. Thales, the earliest Greek philosopher, asserted that everything comes of water. In this, he was only saying what Homer did, who speaks of Oceanus now as the source of the gods and now as the source of all things. The same doctrine was held by Anaximander, the second Greek philosopher, but he applied it to living creatures and, according to a quotation from Sensorinus, to mankind too. Fish or fish-like beings were born of warm water and earth. In these beings men were formed. The embryos remained in them till puberty. Then the fish-like beings opened. Men and women came out, already capable of sustaining themselves. From a Greek compilation, we also learned that these beings, which arose in the damp, were plant-like as well as flesh-like, and they were protected by a sheath of alcanthus leaves. When, what, what are we to think of this account, which transforms, as it were, the image of the primordial child born of a water plant into a scientific theory? At the beginning of the last century, Oaken, the romantic natural philosopher and science of Jena, propounded the same teaching. He based himself neither on an Aximander nor on Sensorius, Sensorinus, but on the scientific and philosophical knowledge of his time. According to him, the first man must have developed in a uterus much larger than the human one. This uterus is the sea. That all living things have come from the sea is a truth that nobody will dispute who has occupied herself with natural history and philosopher. philosophy. Contemporary science disregards every other doctrine. The sea has nourishment for the fetus, slime to be absorbed through its membranes, oxygen for those membranes to breathe. The fetus is not confined so that it can move its membranes at will, even though it should remain swimming about for more than two years. Such fetuses arise in the sea by the thousand, if they arise at all. Some are cast up immature on the shores and perish. Others are crushed against the rocks. Others devoured by carnivorous fish. What does that matter? There are still thousands left to be washed, soft and mature on the beaches where they tear off their membranes, scratch for worms, pull mussels and snails out of their shells. In this mythology of primordial children intended is 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 this mythology of primordial children intended seriously as science? In Oaken's view, unquestionably, and yet the closest parallel to it, outside an Anaximander, is the story which Maui, a child god of the Polynesians, tells of his own birth. Apart from the sea, he had a divine mother who bore him on the seashore, and prematurely at that. I was born at the side of the sea and thrown by you, so he tells his mother, into the foam of the surf after you wrapped me up in a tuft of your hair, which you cut off for that purpose. Then the seaweed formed and fashioned me as caught in its long tangles. In the ever heaving surges of the sea rolled me, folding, folded as I was in them from side to side at length the breeze and squalls which blew from the ocean drifted me onto shore again, and the soft jellyfish of the long sandy beaches rolled themselves around to protect me. His divine ancestor, Tama Nui Kite Arangi, unwound the jellyfishes and perceived a human being, Maui. Oaken himself betrays how, he, how fond he is of mythological images, and above all those of the primordial child. In his essay on the origin of the first man, he speaks about the evolution of animals from plants and remarks, the animal, not merely poetically speaking, but in actual fact, is the final flowering or true fruit of the plant, a genius rocked on the flower. 
So that not only is his scientific thinking inadvertently mythological, the Maui parallels reveals as much, but he also acquainted is also was also acquainted with the image of Prajapi, Prajapati, probably through the mythological studies of the Romantics. There is no need to describe precisely how this happened. It is enough to observe that an image like the world was water, a single flood, only Prajapati could be seen sitting on a lotus leaf, is res Surrected in oak and science. Besides the original god of the Hindus, we could also mention Harpocrates, the Egyptian sun child, who is often shown sitting on a lotus blossom. These ancient mythologies do not undergo a revival in Anaximander, they simply go on living. In his age, the epoch of the great Ionian thinkers, the cosmic content that forms the nucleus of mythology passes over into Greek philosophy. What had hitherto been a highly convincing and effective set of divine figures now begins to turn into a rational teaching. In order to find such things as the process of transformation themselves into more and more rational mythologies, it was not necessary for an Aximander to turn to Oriental or even Egyptian legends. His doctrines on the origin of man are an echo of the basic mythological theme with which we are concerned here. And since we have a Greek philosophem philosoph before us, we must seek that theme first of all in Greek mythology. Among the Greek gods we find Proteus, the ever-changing god of the sea, whose name means the first being. The world of Oceanus and the world of Proteus, respectively primal water and sea, relate to one another as primordial child and newborn child. Both are symbols, or gleichnesses, in the Gothian sense, of timeless birth and transformation. In Greek mythology, however, Oceanus and the sea are the abode of an immense number of peculiar divinities, but the primordial child, who might well be the prototype of the childhood of the great Olympians, is not immediately noticeable among them. Also, the distance that separates the timeless inhabitants of Olympus, the mighty god of Homer and Hesiod, from the world of being and becoming is far too great. How could we expect the Olympians to feel at home in the liquid element? All the more significant, then, is the fact that one of the Olympian children, Apollo, nevertheless has an affinity with the sea. This affinity is not merely his birthplace, Delos, was, which was originally a floating island, although this merits attention from a mythological point of view. There is a deeper lying affinity between Apollo and the sea, and this lends us to the classic Greek image of the connections between sea and child. Like the womb of the mother, Boundless water in an organic part of the image of the primordial child is an organic part of the primordial of Im, a part of the image of the of the primordial child. The Hindus gave emphatic expression to this relationship in the sacred legend of Matsya Purana, named after the fish Matsya Manu, the first man says to the fish-bodied Vishnu. How did this world, shaped like a lotus, spring from your navel in the lotus epoch when you play, when you lay in the world ocean? You lay sleeping in the world ocean with your lotus navel. How did the gods and the host of seers arise in your lotus in those distant times, called forth by your power? The primordial child, here called Vishnu, is accordingly fishy, an embryo and a womb at once, something like an Aximander's ex primal being. Precisely such a fish, which is spontaneously the bearer of children and youth, and the changing shape of child god, is known to Greek mythology. The Greeks called it the uterine beast, and revered it above all the denizens of the deep, as though recognizing in it the ocean's power to bear children. This creature is the dolphin, delph, which means uterus, an animal sacred to Apollo, who, in the view of this relationship, is himself named Apollo Delphineos. There is a whole series of Greek coins showing a dolphin carrying a boy or youth on its back. Eros is another such boyish figure, a winged child whom we shall be discussing soon. Then we have Phalanthios and Taras, the last named being the legendary founder and name giver, giver of the city of Tarantum. The boy riding on a dolphin often wears a flower in his hair, and this seems to indicate a creature midway between fish and bud. Another nuministic figure approaches very closely in this type, though without being dependent on it, to the Indian picture of a child asleep on a sea monster, and this is Phalamon, 
al alias Melikorites, lying dead or asleep on a dolphin, a child god who deserves special study from our point of view. There are Greek legends, translations of the mythological theme into purely human language, which tell how dolphins rescued their mortal favorites or carried the dead safely to shore. But the names of those favorite of the dolphins are often unmistakably mythological, such as Koreanos, master, or Inhalos, he in the sea. The story of Arion the singer, who was rescued from the clutches of pirates by a dolphin, is the best-known example of these legends, proving at the same time that we are in the sphere of in influence of Apollo, the lord protector of poets. The second part of the Homeric hymn to Apollo, held by many to be the second hymn of its own, relates the epiphany of Apollo Delphinios. In the form of a dolphin, the god conducts his first priest to Crisa, the bay on which he sh his shrine has just been founded. His epiphany is an epiphany on a ship. The Delph Del Delphi form Apollo makes a place for himself on the ship of his future priests, a proof that they're here, that here in the Oriental Christian text mentioned at the beginning of this section, fish and ship are equivalent mythological images. As variants of the same theme can mean the same when combined in one. Apollo found his Delphic shrine while yet a child. Apart from Delos itself, the spot chosen forms a significant background for his childhood, the sea between Crete and the Greek mainland. It was there that the dolphin epiphany occurred. No less significant is the seat of the celebrated oracle at Delphi, and the meaning remains the same. Just as the dolphin is the womb among animals, so Delphi is the womb among places. The Ani means that. For the Greeks, the rocky landscape symbolized what was itself symbolized by the dolphin, the sea, and the womb. It was a symbol of the uttermost beginnings of things, of non-being that came into being, and life that came afterwards of the original condition of which every symbol says something different and new, a primal source of mythologems. To these mythologems also brings the mighty feat, so typical of child's god, child gods, that Apollo performed at Delphi, namely the, namely the destruction of the primeval monster. But this would carry us too far afield, as would mythological appre appreciation of the island of Delos. It is enough to know what Guy and Themis, the first two mistresses of Delphi, who were worshipped among with Apollo, prove, rather, what the earth mother revered, revered under these two names proves, that even a rocky landscape can appear in the mythology of the primordial child as the word, world of the mother, the maternal world. Hermes 7. The Homeric hymn to Hermes is a poem which, while paying homage to a Greek god as a divine child, describes him in such a way that the description for it becomes for us a, the classic Greek picture of divine childhood. Hermes' childhood is a special theme of the hymn, and from the source alone it casts its shadow on everything that is here under discussion. It is different from the hymn to Apollo. There, Apollo shed his childhood almost immediately, and we had to sketch in the childish features of the original mythology more vividly, on the basis of other sources. In the Homeric hymn, we cannot forget for a moment that the god who is being honored is a child. In archaic vase paintings, Apollo and his sister Artemis are shown in the arms of their mother Leto, just as Hermes is shown lying in a cradle. But where Hermes also appears with Leto, then this indicates other relationships between him and Leto's children than those mentioned in the Hermaic hymn. In the latter, Apollo is the full-grown god contrasted with the child Her Hermes, while in the vase paintings, the situation is reversed. Mythology admits both the presence of a full-grown Hermes besides the child Apollo, as well as the other way around. In such cases, the fact that a god is shown as a child does not mean that he is of less power or significance. On the contrary, where one divinity appears among the others as a child, it means that its epiphany occupies the central place, or, to be more accurate, the epiphany is there always the epiphany of a child god. The question is, for what reason does the divine child in the god concerned suddenly come to the fore? What has Hermes in him that he should thus become the hero of the Greek classic of divine childhood? The story of the Hermaic hymn is separated from the fluid state of 
primeval mythology by two layers, both of which help to clarify and define it. The first layer is the Greek pantheon itself. It is as though that cosmic substance which, in the godlike figures of the original mythologians, now concentrates its whole radiance at one point, now scatters in all directions, now mingles with darkness, were broken up and refracted in the world of Greek gods like a spectrum. The place each divinity occupies in this spectrum, the color it has, it's determined for all times, the various possibilities being limited by the characteristics of each individual figure, who is one aspect of the world. The other clarifying and formative layer is the Olympian hierarchy of Homeric poetry, which immediately fixes each god's relations to all the rest. The state of genuinely mythological fluidity, such as the swooping of Apollo's and Hermes' childhood and adulthood, is only possible outside the Olympian hierarchy. The childhood of the gods is outside the hierarchy altogether. In a more primitive state, which was prior to this hierarchy, the Olympians were child gods, so too was Hermes. The unknown poet of the so-called Homeric hymn to Hermes solved the problem of bringing the more primitive elements into line with the Olympian hierarchy and expressing them in those terms. The figure of Hermes never lost that more primitive character. It persisted alongside the Olympian hierarchy and the Homeric hymn, and it determined Hermes' color band in the color spectrum from the very beginning. Hermes is the only, or at least almost the only, one among the great Olympians, Apollo alone in his capacity at Aegeus, shares this primitive feature with him, whose presence is marked by an upright piece of wood or stone, the herm. Sacred emblems of this kind, in which it is easy to recognize the naked phallus, were said in ancient times to be in the Kylenic manner, no doubt because Hermes possesses these emblems not only in the Elean point of Kylene, but also in the Arcadian Mount Kylene, his birthplace. The latter was the more celebrated and is connected with the story of his childhood. The Kylenic emblem was a giant phallus of wood. In the Boetian village of Vespei, a bare stone was a sacred emblem of another divine child, Eros, whom we must mention along with Hermes, not merely on this account. Eros is a divinity very closely related by nature to Hermes. Greek mythology always preserved him in childlike form, and the mythology of the birth of the primordial child was also referred to him. His nature, explicit in his name Eros, demanding love, is more uniform in tone than that of Hermes. Nevertheless, the same ground tone is unmistakable in Hermes too. The universe knows a med melody, as we could describe these somewhat complex phenomena, whose theme is the eternal relationship of love, thievery, and affairs. In the masculine key, this melody is Hermes, in the feminine key, the same melody, and yet not quite the same, since man and woman are different, is Aphrodite. The essential affinity between Eros and Hermes is best shown in their relations with the goddess of love. Aphrodite and Eros go together as essentially concomitant forces or principles. Eros, the divine child, is Aphrodite's natural companion and consort. But if the masculine and feminine aspects of the, the nature common to both Aphrodite and Eros be, co be comp composed in one figure, this figure immediately becomes Hermes and Aphrodite rolled into one, Hermaphroditus. This bisexual being has its genealogical place in the Olympian hierarchy as the god of Aphrodite and Hermes, as a child of Aphrodite and Hermes. Hellenistic and still later representations of it are well known, yet the hermaphrodite is not in any sense the invention of the late and decadent art. By the time art had become decadent, the hermaphrodite had lost its original meaning and evolved into a mere decoration, a very charming one. No, the hermaphrodite is a primitive type of divine image. In ethnology, there is a whole literature on the subject. The primitive character of this type in the ancient world is attested by the common cult of Hermes and Aphrodite and Argos in ancient times, and by, by the Cyprian cult of Aphroditos, the male Aphrodite, which was in accord with Argive customs. The Etruscans knew both divinities from the remotest times under the same Greek, or rather pre-Greek name, Hermes as Terms, Aphrodite as Turan. The one is master, O Turanos, the other mistress, Hey, Turonos, an age-old pair, and to delve more deeply, two aspects of the same primal being. 
The mythology of the emergence of the child god out of the original condition of things is, in Greece, connected with two divinities, Eros and Aphrodite, and it occurs accordingly in two variations, the birth of a bisexual primal being and the birth of Aphrodite. The first variation is Orphaic, so-called because con contained in a cosmology ascribed to Orpheus. In the beginning, so we read in this variation, a bisexual being was born of an egg. Orpheus called it Phanes, while in, as, while in Aristophanes, in the famous chorus of the birds, the primal being that came out of the egg bears the name Eros. We have no reason to suspect in the bisexual nature of this being a secret doctrine of later date, which always remained alien to Greek thought and was invented for a special sect. The Aphrodite cults alluded to, which, because of the exchange of clothing between the men and women participating them, caused sexual differences to appear only as possible variations of one and the same being, are in harmony with the meaning of the Orphaic mythology. The winged figure of the egg-born Eros can likewise hardly be separated from the winged goddess of archaic times, and the meaning of this figure lies where rituals and cosmogenic Aphroditism lies. The two things, wickedness and bisexuality, hark back to the same pre-human, indeed pre-childish, still completely undifferentiated state, one of whose forms of expression is the primal water. Eros is the first sign, sorry, Eros is the first among the dolphin-riding children. We can now put this significant fact in another way and say that the winged boy bestriding a dolphin and holding his hands in a strange beast like cuttlefish is none other than the primordial child whose home is the primal water and best known of whose many names is eros in one respect the other variation expresses something even more profound and it itself more comprehensive it is the well-known mythology in his theology theog theogony hesiod relates the birth of aphrodite as follows in vain was the race of the Titans born of the marriage of heaven and earth, Uranus and Gaia. Uranus tried to prevent his children from emerging out of the womb of the earth, but in the end the youngest of them, Kronos, with his mother's help, did a terrible thing. With a sickle he cut off his father's procreative organ as his father was approaching his mother and threw it into the sea. From it there arose Aphrodite out of the foaming waves. In this version, as in the melody that utters the unutterable, the beginning and the end of an ontology coincide. Begetting and birth are identical, as also the begetter and the begotten. The phallus is the child, and the child, Aphrodite, an eternal stimulus to further procreation. The image of the foam-born goddess puts the idea of genius, of genesis, and timeless beginnings as, such, as succinctly, as perfectly, as only the language of mythology can. The birth of Aphrodite is a variation of the mythology of the primordial child, which makes intelligible for us, intelligible in only way possible to the Greek religion, the mythological way, how it is that the stone in Thespe is identical with Eros and the Kylenic emblem with the Hermes child. We also understand why procreation and birth, Herms and mythological images, all variations in the primordial child, are equivalent symbols expressing the same unutterable thought. The original Herm stood on a mountain where the child Hermes was born in a cave. The cave was a place of primeval chaos, the nature of which is indicated in the name Delphi. At another very ancient spot, Sacred to Hermes, the god possessed not only a herm, but also spray a spring with fishes in it, which belonged to him and were not allowed to be caught. In the Homeric hymn, there is no trace of these archaic characteristics. There the cave appears as a habituation worthy of a goddess, the mother of Zeus's son. The Hermes child takes his place at once in the Olympian hierarchy, and, as he leaves the cave, the sun and the moon shine down on him. In the hymn, only such an unusual things occur as are possible in moonlight, and the sort of thing characteristic of the Hermaic world Homer knows and acknowledges. The Homeric poet is restrained. He achieves great art because he manages to portray, in the figure of a child, an aspect of the world which is at the same time a whole cosmos on its own. Hermes, in relation to other grown-up gods, keeps within the bounds of his childishness, whereas the footprint of an Indian child god are always the footprint of a giant, even though the child is a mere midget. The Greek poet has to resort to considerable cunning in order to make giant footsteps plausible in Hermes' case. 
This only shows Hermes the better as the father of all cunning. His first encounter in the Homeric world brings something very primitive, mythologically speaking, to light. The fortuitous nature of this encounter is typical of Hermes, and it is primitive only in so far as chance and accident are an intrinsic part of primeval chaos. In fact, Hermes carries over this particularly this particularity of primal chaos, accident, which the Olympians order. Hermes meets a tortoise, a primeval-looking creature, for even the youngest tortoise could, by the looks of it, be described as the most ancient creatures in the world. It is one of the oldest animals known to mythology. The Chinese see it in the mother, the venerable mother of all animals. The Hindus hold Kaspiana, Kas. Yapa, in honor, the tortoise man, the father of their eldest gods, and say that the world rests on the back of a tortoise, a manifestation of Vishnu, a dwelling in the nether nethermost regions. It supports the whole body of the world. The Italian name Tartaruga keeps alive a designation dating from late antiquity, according to which the tortoise holds the lowest layer of the universe, named Tartaras, Tartaruxos. Further, Although, in less striking a manner, the tortoise, like the dolphin, is one of the shapes of Apollo, in the Homeric hymn it appears only as a most innocent, innocuous beast, the plaything and sacrificial victim of an ingenious child, albeit divine. The tortoise seems to be no more cosmic than the playthings of gods generally are, when the gods happen to be Greek gods and do not trespass beyond the natural order of things. The tortoise merely undergoes a Homeric miracle. Something divine glimmers through, the chance for a divine game. Hermes makes it into a lyre. But can we say that the invention of the first lyre, which the Hermes child gave to Apollo as a gift, is in a certain sense cosmic? We are speaking here of cosmic content that can express itself in a mythological, philosophical, mathematical, musical, or in any other way. This is only possible because of the nature of the cosmic content as such. As an idea, that is to say intellectually, it can be expressed in purely philosophical and mathematical terms. But it can at the same time be pictorial and musical. Of the pictorial wealth of the mythology, we can best speak in terms of music. Sidi Tolne was the first to see the musical nature of the cosmic content in the most pictorial of all material, classic painting. And another Hungarian scholar, D. Kovendi, showed how far the Greeks the birth how for, how, how for the Greeks the birth of the divine child in his capacity as Eros Proterythmos signifies the rhythm and musical creation of the universe. The lyre in one hand of the primordial child expresses the musical quality of the world quite apart from the poet's intention. It is first and foremost characteristic of Hermes himself. The Homeric poet sends the musical nature of the universe as essentially her her hermetic and located it in the Hermes color band of the world spectrum. In all probability, the poet was not seeking this primal music, but its higher Apollonian form. If, however, the boy riding a dolphin, who sometimes bears the name of Phalanthos, has a lyre in his hand, we are driven to think not merely of his relationship with Apollo Delphinios, but of a more general, a primary connection that existed before all specific names, the connection of water, child, and music. Zeus, 8. Zeus, the protector and mainstay ruler and representative of the Olympic order, which is his order and is in absolute contrast with the original fluid condition of things, is the biggest boy among the child gods. He too was a divine child before he became the father of gods and men. We must therefore ask a sort of historical question. What does this before mean in the history of religion? We know that the biographical sequence child god adult god, has only an incidental significance in mythology. It serves to group different mythologies together, or it acquires a special significance only when the actual cosmic growth is symbolized in the growing god, as in the divine child of Virgil's fourth ecologue. It is the same with the death of certain divinities. It is never a biographical death, always a cosmic one. Zeus has no life history, but since his rule is an essential part of his nature, there is a mythology of how this rulership came to be attained, a story of struggle and victory and new world order, a story which reveals the meaning of the new world founded by Zeus. In mythology, the child god can exist side by side with the ageless god and independent of him. Consequently, it is quite possible for the earlier life phase of a divinity to appear considerably later in the history of religion. This was the case 
with the classical, youthful figure of gods whom the Greeks knew in the archaic period as bearded men. We cannot deny the priority of the primordial, primordial children, child, whose various reflections are the individual child's gods, when compared with the Olympian world picture. Wherever we meet him in Greek mythology, he seems to have broken through the barrier of the Olympian hierarchy, or, in the case of dolphin riding boar, boy, to be something of a survival. Such is the general impression we have gained from our study of ancient material, without giving specific proofs. We have not used the term primitive, primordial, primeval, etc. in a cosmological sense any more than we did in our study of the birth of Helen. What, what, what we meant was a timeless quality which can crop up as much in later times as in earlier ones. We can call psychological research above all Jung's to witness in this, in this respect, since it has demonstrated exactly, step by step, the existence of archaic elements in the psychic life of the modern man. Here, as the term archaic and primitive have no chronological significance, though they have strictly scientific meaning, this meaning lies in the fact that the phenomenon so described have an actual correspondence with certain earlier phenomena in the history of mankind which can be determined chronologically. Mixed forms, or to put it yet another way, undifferentiated forms can be shown to exist in the early period of Greek art. The relative earliness of the primordial child becomes very probable in the light of such considerations, but it is not proved. We have not yet inquired into the origin of the mythological in image under discussion. It cannot be emphasized too much that the question of its origin can only be solved on a planetary scale, or to express it in more human terms, in a way that takes account of people's whole existence from every conceivable scientific angle. We must context ourselves here with the with the likelihood that a common basic theme is present in the background, wherever we hear the harmony of its variations. As to when this basic theme came into being, all we have said is that it may perhaps be relegated to a period compared with which not only the Indian and Finnish sources are considerably younger, but the whole character of Greek culture as well. We have drawn no conclusions from the Indian, Finnish, or other parallels as to the time or place of origin. We leave undecided in principle the question of whether the place of origin was an ideal place, that is to say the real, po real, the possible result of the human mind seeing the same aspect of the cosmic content everywhere in the same image, or whether it was a definite geographical focus of culture where the great mythological archetypes were created for all time. For the present, it is not a question of the place of origin so much as the most accessible layer underlying the Olympian order. In the case of the child Zeus, the primacy of the primordial child, which we have conceived only in a very general way, can be proved in the history of religion. In a sacred hymn probably composed around 300 BC, graved upon a stone much later in Crete, Zeus is apophysized as the biggest boy, boy Megistos Kuros. This hymn is typical of Cretan religion in historical times. It hails the youthful Zeus in his sanctuary situated on, or rather as the sanctuary, was probably a cave in Mount Dicte. God was depicted beardless in the form of a youth, and thus, like the dolphin riding boy of the coins, appeared as a young Apollonian figure. This was in keeping with classical and post-classical taste. Originally, the nature of this spot, which was named among the birthplaces of Zeus, was exemplified by the figure of a child. All this is characteristically Cretan, and can be shown from a very carefully conducted investigation that takes all the monuments into account. Two indisputable points have been ascribed which enable us to form an opinion on Cretan religion. The first is that the child god must be regarded as a given fact in Crete something to which all the other local mythological variants subsequently became attached. Because the one already mentioned, two other mountains were indicated as the birthplace of Zeus, and Zeus is far from being the only child god in Crete to be exposed and nourished by animals. For secondly, secondly, not only is the, god, is the child god itself a proven fact in Crete, but it's orphan's fate as well. For the Cretans, Zeus, like the other child gods of more modest rank, was a child abandoned by its mother. The island, the island of Crete was the center of a very rich and important civilization that preceded the Greek in the eastern Mediterranean. It is almost impossible to think of the peculiar feature of the creto grecian religion as altogether independent of the more ancient period of culture. 
evidently we have to do with the peculiarity of this kind here. Some investigators have believed that they could see two originally completely independent divinities in the Zeus child of the Cretans and Zeus the thunder and the ruler of the world on the Hellenic mainland. But how such totally different figures, if they are not an ideal unity, could possibly be distinguished with the same nature is a question to which no satisfactory answer has, of course, been forthcoming. Neither can any proof be abduct abducted that Zeus's birthplace on the mainland was really latter and secondary, the result of competition with the Cretans. On the other hand, it is a striking fact that certain extremely ancient features are associated with the birthplaces on the mainland, which in Crete have receded into the background or disappeared altogether. A peculiar antiquity attaches to everything that has been handed down about Zeus's Arcadian birthplace, Mount Lycaon. Here the birthplace is not confined to a cave. No cave is even mentioned. That in, in, that in itself seems to contrast with the Cretan story. But when we examine the Cretan localities more closely, we find that there too, the mountain itself is every bit as important as the cave. The cave is a part of the mountain which forms a sacred spot, just as Mount Kelini is the sanctuary of Hermes. An unmentionable sacrifice that took place at the Dicti Shrine is marked by a spring. On the other hand, we know that it was that what was sacrificed to Zeus. We know that it was what. On the other hand, we know what it was that was sacrificed to Zeus on Mount Lycaon. It is expressed very inaccurately when the scholars speak of a human sacrifice. An infant was sacrificed, obviously, to the divine infant. The place was a true place of the dead, where the phantoms cast no shadow. Whoever trod its precincts was bound to die within a year. Another tradition speaks of a birthplace of Zeus and Thebes, where the islands of the blessed were supposed to be. Both traditions explain why nobody could die in Zeus's Cretan cave, and why even the thieves that broke in were transformed into birds, among others into a bird in the name of Kerberos. In all these places we find ourselves beyond life as we know it. Either we cease to exist or are eternal outside time. Water, too, is associated with the birthplace of Zeus in Arcady. Water nymphs, in particular Needy, the goddess of the river that bears her name, became the first nurses of the newborn child. In Zeus's birthplace is Messena, Mount Ithonmi. Water was brought daily to the shrine of Zeus's Ithomatas from the spring in which he was first bathed. Water probably played a part in the creation cult of Zeus beside milk and honey the ritual ailment of infants, but the traditions of the mainland are more eloquent in this respect and point as a whole more clearly to the basic theme than do the Cretan. The basic theme is the same in both Crete and on the mainland, the appearance of the primordial child in a primitive spot connected with the maternal elements, rock and water. In both cases, the antiquity, the extreme age of its variants is, not is, is unquestionable, and yet we know, have no adequate grounds for concluding that the mythologem and the cult of the primordial child came out of Crete to Arcady, Messima, and to Thebes. Compared with the traditions concerning the cult of Mount Lycaon, all modern reconstructions of the Cretan cult are, ha are, so, ha are so many insubstantial in shades. An older layer underlying the more recent Homeric Greek layer seems un unmistakable, but two things are still out of place. We cannot with any certainty ascribe the older layer geographically to Crete as a place of origin of cult, and the newer layer to Hellas as its receiver, nor can we make a claim, clean division between the Cretan and Minoan Mycenaean religion on the, other, on the one hand and Greek on the other. We get a working basis for the division only when we take into account another portion of the Mediterranean world, the area of the ancient Italic and Roman religion. Ancient Italic and Roman cannot be distinguished as purely chronological or geographical layers, nor can these terms be linked up exclusively with the new migrations of racial groups. Nonetheless, the ancient Italic layer is older and more saturated with mold Mediterranean element elements than the Roman, older but contemporary too. Taking up our stand in early Rome, we find characteristically Roman elements already present in their religion, while at the same time the ancient Italic style of religion still persists in sacred localities outside Rome. These are, in fact, two styles that which can be distinguished from one another exactly. 
characteristic of the Roman style of religion, compared with the ancient Italic, is something negative, namely the absence of mythologems. That is the result of a process fully in keeping with the Roman mentality for which the word demystification and my thysirang has recently been coined. It was, if it was intended to say that the true religion of the Romans was wholly devoid of myths with a purely political idea at its center, then such a term would be mistaken and misleading. The Roman religion was neither empty of myth nor, in its mature form, did it show itself incompatible with the myths of the Homeric order. Again, that what, then, was the process of demystification directed? One certain example of the kind of thing that was debarred from Roman religion by demystification is the figure of Jupiter Puer, the child Jupiter. The divinity corresponding to the Greek Zeus was known in Rome only as Pater, or Jupiter. Another of his manifestations, the subterranean Vedivius, was also worshipped in Rome, but they tried to separate him as far as possible from Jupiter's heavenly father aspect. The Vediovis was portrayed as an Apollonian youth who can only be thought of as the beardless youthful Zeus of the Cretans. Originally, he was named Jupiter Puer, like the one who had his cult in the immediate neighborhood of Rome, in Praenesti, an underground cult in the grottoes of the mountain on which the town was built, beside a sacred spring connected with the goddess Fortuna. Grottoes rock Water, even Fortuna herself, recall the undifferentiated state in which we are accustomed to meet the primordial child. He appears still more clearly in the cult of Jupiter and Zuras in Terra Sina, south of Rome. His shrine, set on the rocky prominence of the foothills, juts into the oceanic world of the Tyr of the Tyr Henthian. An ancient Italic form of Jupiter, he belongs to the same group as the Roman Vendios and the Jupiter Puer of Praenesti. How much his cult concentrated on his childhood is shown by a discovery made during the excavations of his temple. This is a collection of leaden votive offerings that we can only call childlike playthings or a toy kitchen. Among the sacrificial kitchen utensils are 15 dishes, most of them empty, but three with fishes on them. And of the two gridians in the collection, the larger contain no food, but two fishes are lying on the smaller. The divinity probably received fish offerings, which is not without precedent for the old Italic style of the Jupiter cult. Thus the mythology of the primordial child existed in ancient Italy, as in Crete, and in the older strata of Greek religion on the mainland. It was alien to the Homeric hierarchy of the gods, as it was to the generally Roman pantheon, or rather it became alienated from them. We cannot say with any certainty that it derived from Crete, nor ascribe it exclusively to the sphere of the old Mediterranean culture. We can, however, assert that in Crete there existed an older specter of culture that embraced pre homeric Greeks and ancient Italy, the spirit of which was more fundamentally mythological than the spirit of Homer or Rome. The mythologium of the primordial child is characteristic, not of this more recent, but of an older mentality. That the spirit of this older sphere was fundamentally mythological is certain, though its temporal and spatial boundaries were not so certain. <laughs> From an age of primitive mythology still projects into the historical epochs of the Greece of Greece and Italy. We now have one a vantage point from which the classic youthfulness of the Greek gods can be understood and judged correctly, not merely ontologically, as in our first chapter, but historically. Central to the Olympic order which replaced the primitive mythological state of things is Zeus the father. In spite of that, he is represented in his Dictian birthplace as the beardless youth and worshipped in this form elsewhere in Crete. Thus far, those, those scholars are right who interpreted the Megistos Kuros of the hymn as the biggest boy. Greek religion in its classical form is the religion of the world order established by Zeus as related by Hesiod. The new images of divine childhood are relegated to the margin of the new Zeus world and the primordial childhood mythology remains outside its borders. In this religion, the youth is a more acceptable manifestation of divinity than the child. The youthfulness of Greek divinities is the result of a transformation, albeit a different one, from that which can be dedu deduced from the artistic remains by themselves. In the monuments, the reign of the bearded gods precedes the age of the youths, and we see now that the reign of the child is still older. The image of the primordial child breaks through, transfigured into the ideal figure of the youth. 
that such a transformation is possible is implicit in the meaning of the Greek word for the boy, and is therefore attested by entomology as well. The supposedly male child, while yet in its mother's room, is called kuros, the ephibi and the youth capable of bearing arms is still a kuros. Eros himself appears in well-known face paintings as a winged ephibi. The divine youths of classical art, the classical idea of Apollo, Hermes, and the young Dionysus, are not to be taken as indicating a general rejuvenescence of the Hellenistic world. It is not that the bearded divinities have gone back to their, on their development, even in the Iliad, Hermes appears as youth, but that the idealized Ephibi of the Agonal Age gave validity to the divine child in a somewhat mature form, more in keeping with the essence of these divinities than the full-grown man. Also, the hermaphroditic character of the primordial child gained acceptance when the idea of the nymph-like boy appeared in Greek culture. It is through this... It is as though this were only the recrudescence of the bisexual primordial child in secularized form. 9. Dionysus Not all the child gods of the older and younger Mediterranean world can be mentioned here. Yet besides Zeus, Apollo, and Hermes, we must also recall one of the greatest, Dionysus. W. F. Otto, in his book On This Divinity, devotes a beautiful chapter to the latter's profound connection with the human, humid element. Suffice it here only to recapitulate, recapitulate what is most important. The Iliad speaks of the sea as Dionysus' refuge, where Thetis acts as a nurse to the young god. According to a Lactanian variant of the mythologium, the Dionysus' child was washed ashore in the chest of his, with his dead mother. Another of Dionysus' nurses, Eno, the mother of the god of the child god Palaimon, also appears as a sea goddess. In his cult at Lerna, Dionysus is summoned to rise from the deep. He is known as Pelagios, he of the sea, Lim, Limneios, he of the lake, and Limnagrinis, the lake-born. His epiphany on a ship in the shape, according to a Homeric film, he, him of a boy, distinguishes him in the same sense that Apollo Del Delphinios was distinguished. Only... About one thing are we not altogether clear. How could anybody, even a god, come out of the depths of the sea on a ship which floats on the water? We now know that the prime element, whose symbol, and nothing more than a symbol, is the sea, has a, a peculiarity that, that floating in it and rising out of it mean the same thing. Both imply a state of being not yet separated from non-being yet still being. The dolphin riding boy on the, of the coins, the classic Greek representation of the primordial child god, is sometimes shown winged, sometimes holding a lyre, sometimes holding the club of Hercules. Accordingly, he is to be viewed now as Eros, now as an Apollyon, now as a Hermetic or Herculean figure. We must take him, in fact, as these divinities were while they were in the womb of the universe, floating in the embryonic state on the primal waters. It is not for nothing that the cupids of late antiquity have the attributes of the great gods, not for nothing that their activities embrace, as in the frescoes of the Pompeii Casa del Verti, the whole gamut of existence. They are the ground tone which the world of late antiquity, deaf to all subtler melodies, could still perceive. The primordial child, to continue the metaphor, is the monotone that consists of all notes at once, the leitmotiv that develops into all the other divine figures. It develops first and foremost in its polar opposite, Zeus, for the biggest boy of the Cretan hymn is the summation and epitome of all the undifferentiated possibilities, as well as all of those that are realized in the pure form of gods. In this way, then, as his polar opposite, Zeus stands closest to the primordial child. The, for the one pole always implies the possibility of the other, together with it, forms a higher unity, as is in the case of the child Zeus and Zeus the father. Dionysus stands in a different relationship to the primordial child. He is so close to it that, to stick to our metaphor and express the gods acoustically, he is the overtone to the god tone, the ground tone. The dolphin riding boy is the more often shown with the attribute of Dionysus than with those of any other god. And in no Greek cult, save that of Zeus, is the childhood state so important as in the cult of Dionysus. Here we have the same sort of identity we met with in the Homer Hermetic sphere. 
There, the god and the herm were the same. Here, something is hidden in the winnowing basket, and it is called lix, lixnitis, the slumberer in the winnowing basket. It is the child Dionysus, and in exactly the same way, the Kylenic emblem was the child Hermes. In some incomprehensible or perhaps only mythological manner, Dionysus is identified on the one hand with the emblem that was carried round in his cult, and with the symbol concealed in the winnowing basket, namely the phallus, and on the other hand with the bearded god who, in one of his appellations, is man and woman, in one person. Dionysus was bisexual in the first place, not merely in the effeminate later uh, in the effeminate later portrayals. The rounded figures of his archaic companions, the daemonic dancers whom he possessed, are only reflections of his hermaphroditic nature. Dionysus is a low note in the divine scale, but we still have to have not plumbed his deepest vibrations. We shall let them ring out for a moment in conclusion. Vainam Moinain old and wily greeted the little copper man who emerged from the waves with the strange words, Most contemptible of heroes, heroes, no matter that better than a dead man, and a face on you like a corpse. He is evidently alluding to the newcomer's kinship with the souls of the dead, which dwell in the water. The psychic aspect of Hermes Psychopompus, shepherd of souls, is equally obvious. As a divinity, he was no less ghost-like than childish. Apollo, in his ancient italic form, expressed the same dark aspects as Vidiovius, the Jupiter of the underworld. The Zeus child of the Cretans, fed by a swarm of little creatures who were souls, the bees, had something of a god, was something of a god, had something of a god of the, of the dead about him. His Cretan cave had the property of a place of the dead, just as his other sanctuary had on Mount Lycaon. In Crete, they even showed his grave. The state which glimpsed the image of the child was described as being not yet separated from non-being, yet still being, can also be put like this, not yet separated from being, yet still non-being. Such is the condition of the departed as expressed by the figures of divine youth on antique gravestones, a boy in cloak and hood, a genius, cal cu culatus, as well as numberless cupids. The sea gods and dolphins on tombs and sarcophagi point in the same direction, and here, too, in the sepulchral world, we come to the deepest shadow in all the darkness of Dionysus. All his symbols appear as sepulchres, Sepulchres, too. What the men of antiquity were representing by this was not merely the tense of equilibrium on the two aspects of that state, the hovering of the newborn and the departed between being and non-being, but the certainty that the downward trending path takes an upward turn leading to the divine and that the strongest will be born of the weakest. Are we speaking of the orphan child of Porklar? Or are we speaking of the uh, at the onset of the dismembered Dionysius child? Are we concerned with a primitive dream, a vision, something in a bygone religion? Or with the ancient philosophem? Are we evoking an immemorial melody, an immemorial picture? We shall let the subject remain vague and undecided in its essence. For that was our subject, the undecided, the undifferentiated of the old, the primordial child. <laughs>